and a lot of people there's a lot of noise on the net extreme amount of noise of is there a cure uh what's the death or the mortality rate and this is totally irrelevant at this point in time in this point in time all we need to do is slow down their spread nothing else if we can uh, slow it down effectively it will be just another common cold if we don't stop it effectively it'll be much more severe than the flu mm -hmm. i have a question what would you recommend for communications on the net just what you said about big noise and I see all the, any, just anyone is putting COVID uh, in their titles. Yeah. And they try to search engine optimization, optimize just anything related to COVID, which is ugly, really, is an etiquette. But I would like to hear your advice how to communicate uh, related to COVID. Uh, ultimately, one of the one of the things I did a, a, a presentation a few weeks ago in front of medical students locally, which was uh, the the inverse relationship between the amount of information we get and the critical thinking. The more information we're overloaded with, the less critical thinking there is because we're trying to see the next big thing, and we're opening our channels of of uh information inflow inflow and it's reducing our capacity to discriminate and, and to think critically which is uh having a very negative impact on what's happening with information because people don't have time to fact check they just uh, are headliners reading the, the titles of, of many things and they don't have time to fact check because they want to get on the next big thing which is so fast Information is such a deluge, it's like a, it's a, like a fire hose, and we're trying to drink it from a fire hose. And uh, it's, it's very bad because with the COVID epidemic, all the news outlets are trying still, according to their old business models, to, uh, to, be, uh, to have a higher readership or to have a higher viewership. And in order to do that, they need to feed the beast called right. people who are viewing, viewers. And feeding the beast actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and you cannot discriminate the, the noise from the, from the signal, which is extremely bad in this case because things we need to do, and that is slow the epidemic down. We don't need to think about cure because it's too early the people who are dying usually start dying after a month and a half to two months after the initial part of the epidemic in, in large numbers. And the real problem will become when they start overwhelming the, 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 the healthcare system. But that can be delayed to a very long time. So ultimately people shouldn't be dying so fast if we can slow it down. But we are not talking about slowing it down. We're talking about cure. We're talking about um, different viruses. We're talking about lots of other things. And we're not talking about the basic behaviors that people need to have, very basic behaviors, which are not that self-evident because they, uh, part of the behaviors are actually protecting others. It's not about protecting yourself. It's about protecting others. And because of that, uh, a lot of people, especially currently because uh, the word started spreading that this is something that kills predominantly the elderly or the, the people after, um, after 60, uh, above 60. So young people started saying, well, I'm not at risk. I don't have an issue with that. And they go to, to the beach and they go to bars and to discotheques, which is actually not the case because they are transmitters, very, very efficient ones at that. They transmit the disease a lot. And also there's lots of people who are now starting to uh, come into hospitals with severe disease, young people, 20, 30 years old, who come into with severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if they start coming in later because of their higher immunity and their stronger bodies, they will have to displace somebody who is already on a ventilator which is a very big moral decision on part of the healthcare system. So uh, there's lots of, of moral issues around this and we need to approach it from a societal perspective. We cannot approach it from an individual perspective. 
we need to achieve um, limiting the spread and reducing mortality. The two together can only happen if we do it as a society. It cannot happen if we do it as individuals. And do you think that, for example, I read a communications um, best practices mm -hmm. from about 40 PR organizations globally that had um, for their image visualization only the corona photography, nothing on it. So um, is this a correct way to, to say that best practices to communicate is to have uh, this visual of the corona? virus um it depends what you want to achieve currently i think people have gone into a very uh, reactive and passive communication mode they're they're just trying to absorb as much as they can around this virus when they actually don't need about two-thirds to three-quarters of that information it's totally irrelevant on a personal level yeah uh, you cannot be treated unless there is registered medications to register them is somebody else's remit. It's not a personal decision on what you'll be treated with. So uh, searching for information on treatments is because, at least I think it is, because people are not, um, they don't actually believe that governments will do the best in, in their interest. And they're trying to kind of um, advance it, try to search for information for themselves before somebody else has searched the information. Experts are not experts anymore. Everybody who has an internet access and a Facebook account is an expert. And so they're trying to search for the next big thing, the, the, the wonderful drug that is out there somewhere in, internet, in the internet and scientists have not yet found it. And that kind of activity actually generates an immense amount of noise and so the actual signal gets lost. People who are uh, who are who are tasked with the with the job of limiting this uh, epidemic worldwide. So the WHO, the CDC, you know, the big institutions of scientists who are tasked with the job of limiting the spread, their voice is just one of the channels which many people are listening to. But it's not the channel. It's not. I mean. So it, the information gets so uh, skewed towards new and fantastic and, and conspiracy and whatever else is out there that the signal is almost drowned, almost. So you're muted. From yesterday, Google released uh, selected resources like go to uh, medical uh, resource, um, World Health Organization. I have not scrolled it yet, but I believe that they have, it, it's on top uh, of everything related mm -hmm. to COVID. So most probably what you are saying from tomorrow gets uh, another flow that people can go to the uh, truthful resources. Well, there's, there's several ways of doing that. And uh, one way was uh, creating something called the HON code, which is health on the net. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a foundation where um, in order to be listed and to have a badge on your site, which is a HON code, you need to abide by certain rules and not to be uh, conductive to, to viral fake news. Um, ultimately, in order to have accurate, up-to-date, and verified information, somebody must vet that information. It needs to be filtered. Any filtration is seen as um, changing or tweaking it, even if a scientist is doing it in the public health. Ultimately, some decisions need to be made in the public health. And for example, uh, unlimited access to uh, the World Wide Web through your, uh, through your phone is not in your best health interest because there are diseases like attention deficit disorder which can actually happen because of overuse of this channel. Yeah. But somebody will say, you're limiting my, my human rights by not allowing me to, to use my phone all day. 
Monica and Bob, please unmute yourself and ask questions. I'm recording for our Onibor channel now. Hey, Alex, you know, uh, here in uh, the US, um, increasingly people are saying that, hey, uh, what's the big deal? This is going to be, the, uh, they're, they're using an economic argument against the uh, self quarantining because they maintain that. Uh, it's only going to take out three and a half percent of the population. What's the big deal? Um, the big deal is that uh, it only takes three and a half of the population. If you're China, you have young people and you have drastic measures which are nothing to do with, with democracy. If you're not China and you're Italy, it's closer to nine percent of the population. And currently, the the because I know, I mean, I've been exposed both to the U.S. healthcare system and also to the Canadian one. They're quite different. In the U.S., uh, um, the, the mentality of the population is uh, everyone is basically on their own. So societal support is much less, uh, much less developed in the U.S. than it is, in, let's say, in Canada or in Europe. And ultimately, this is about society. It's not about the individuals because an individual can go off on their Texas ranch and stay indoors and nothing will happen and the, the whole thing will blow over. This is about society. And there's two things here, which I'll, I'll give you the two extremes, at least from my perspective. Currently, uh, the elderly, 60 plus, who are less economically active, uh, they're the ones who get the brunt of this, in, in the, of this infection and they're the ones that die off in drones. I, I showed you the mortality curves People above 70 have a 15% chance of dying. Uh, now, if you look from an economic standpoint, this is, you know, you're uh, unburdening the, the pension, the 401k. You're unburdening the pension system because basically the old people die off and only the younger left. So you have a, a booming economy. Will the, will the uh, answer about the economy versus the mortality be the same if this virus was affecting your children instead of your parents. Will those same people talk the same way if it was their children dying instead of their parents dying? And it's a very interesting, um, let's say, um, moral and ethical dilemma. And actually uh, being quarantined in countries which are enforcing quarantine like Bulgaria, for example, and other European countries, people, have to go indoors uh, they miss a lot some of the communication and and just walking around the streets and they start appreciating how important that was before it got taken away the virus has changed a lot of things if you have money now it doesn't really matter that much because you have to stay indoors so you can't show off your new car or your new dress so it's less important now to have more money because you can't show off. You have to stay indoors. So it's a very big change. And uh, I think that apart from the fact that some people are saying that um, over the drink on the other side of the big ponds, uh, it's because of the election coming up that people are taking measures. Uh, I believe that people who are actually experts, ep epidemiologists and virologists, understand the severity of the situation because this is not a flu. The flu has a mortality rate of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. This is 30 times higher. It's 3.5% in China because until recently, more than half of the population that had died or been affected was in China and they're quite a young population. And they have enforced measures where not a lot of the population actually got sick only a part of the population in Wuhan. Every consecutive canton that got infected has a very flat uh, uh, rate of, of actually infections because they are doing some really drastic quarantining over there. In Italy, they didn't do it. And you can see what's happening. 600 to 800 per day die in Italy. And Italy is a much smaller country than the States is. The only thing that's working for the States is that you're spread out much more. You have much less cities which are megapolises like New York or or, or, or your big cities, you know, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, etc. 
many of your people are living in uh, single-story America, which is spread out in, in houses far apart, which is a part of the, the measure, social distancing. So most of the people who are living in the countryside won't be hit as hard, but the people living in the large cities, they will be hit very hard. And social distancing in New York is, will not be a pretty sight. Yeah. Uh, so, Alex, thank you your, uh, for your insights. It uh, makes me think about the news. How are, what kind of influence do they have on the viewers? Yeah. Just today, there was a video uh, going around in social media and in the news about the situation in a hospital in Italy. Mm -hmm. Very very severe situation there in the in the panic no not panic room in the emergency uh, intensive care room yeah emer it's actually it's the emergency room mm -hmm. it's not even the intensive care but they do the intensive mm -hmm. care there because there is no space mm -hmm. um and it's dramatic uh, what is shown there what impact does this have on the audience? For example, the ones who think the whole mess is only a flu and they don't take it serious, wouldn't they? Uh, wouldn't they say, "Oh, that's not true" or something like this? No, Do you I think don't. this uh, video would turn their opinion around? No, I can I can tell you that a lot of people can rationalize around lots of things. I mean, if you look at the Second World War, people were yeah. rationalizing around lots of things which would be seen as crazy afterwards. Yes. Yeah, but um, what's happening currently is uh, many of the people who see these pictures are saying, yeah, but, you know, not everybody there is dying of coronavirus. Some yeah. are dying of, because of a stroke or a heart attack, etc., etc., and it's because... Uh, many people are loading into the system. A lot of uh, people who are infected are loading the system. It's being overrun so that the other associated diseases cannot be treated well, So, which is why the high mortality. Um, I also have some ideas of why it's happening. Part of those ideas is because currently in our, uh, in our society, we regard healthcare as a cost. We don't regard it as an investment. And because it's seen as a cost in many governments, it's uh, it's run as a business on a lean string. So it's just in time, only the necessary resources. There, there's no excess capacity anywhere. So whenever you have a shock like this, where you have a high demand for services, the system is not ready to absorb them. And which is why it's very easy to overrun the healthcare system because there's no excess capacity at all. You saw what the Chinese did with building a huge hospital. There's lots of people who are doing the same thing all over the world because they know that they're not prepared. But the thing you can do is you can build a hospital, you can buy ventilator machines, but how can you train a, an expert uh, intensivist, anesthesiologist in a couple of weeks? You can't. Uh, we had one of our major uh, intensivists in our country. He did an interview yesterday. And I talked to him because I know him personally. And he said, you know, when I was running the intensive care unit, in order to train a nurse, a nurse to do things as it should be done, I needed about two years. A nurse which is caring for an intensive care patient, there's about 2.2 nurses per patient because you need at least two shifts, 12-hour shifts, and you need 10% reserve in case she gets sick or she, she faints on the job. They walk about 18 miles per day around the patient, and they carry about 600 kilograms, which is about 1,200 pounds of weight, just caring for that patient, one patient. Can we get with the amount of patients we'll have with acute respiratory distress syndrome, can we get the right amount of nurses? And if we don't, the patients will be dying not because of the IRDS, they'll be dying because of lack of, of uh, 
not of equipment even, but because of a lack of, uh, of people who can care for them, expert care, carers, not somebody who's just fresh out of school. And questions like this are not being asked. They're not being asked as a society because this is not something we can fix quickly. It's something which we need time to fix. And the only way we can gain time is if we slow the epidemic. Monica, unmute yourself. And maybe I stop recording. I, yeah. Thank Alex. you, Alex. Yeah. There, there were uh, a few points. Cost versus invest. So that's uh, new to me to think, to regard things like this. That's how the system of healthcare has shifted in the past uh, 20 years, I guess, or 30 years. They were counting uh, on costs. It's and just in time, so yeah. the the whole the whole logistic is commercialized to bring exactly. it in just in time. Exactly, exactly. It's optimized as you would optimize a manufacturing facility. Right, right. And uh, a manufacturing facility. I mean, there are two ways to optimize a process. One is called lean, and the other is called agile. And the philosophy behind them are different. With lean, you're trying to to uh, weed out any excesses and just leave the, the bare essentials to actually do the work. It's great for, for uh, a conveyor belt, but in, <laughs> but in highly variable, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in highly variable environment, you need to be able to shift resources quickly. Then you need agile optimization, which is not necessarily lean. Uh, healthcare has been optimized with lean uh, activities and, and measures and not with agile ones. So any shocks like this are totally out of, of scope. They just they just go off the scales. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't sound it sounds pretty grim the future. Because from my perspective, what what's in place right now, our economic system doesn't respond well to humanity. Absolutely. It, it, the bottom line is only about the resource, which is money. Yeah. So, yeah. One. you know, th this, this, you know, I, I'll bet, I'll bet this is going to be repeated in the not too distant future. Five years ago, there's a TED talk, uh, Google it, uh, a TED talk of Bill Gates. It's as if he's describing what's happening now, five years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the last five years, we could have done a lot of changes in the healthcare system if we were listening. And uh, he's yeah. a guy who didn't say, I told you so. He's a guy who's invested $200 million now to, towards research on COVID uh, vaccines. So, right. But he anyway, predicted it. Yeah. Alex, it's, can it's you not that difficult. your name just for the recording? I need to bring on the presentation. Yeah. So who you are. Hi. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alex Simitchev. I'm a pulmonary physician currently working in Bulgaria and um, hopefully will be part of the uh, small group of people who will be trying to, to turn the country around and uh, mitigate um, the, the issues of COVID in Bulgaria because we're a very small country and our healthcare system is lagging behind many of the other European systems. So if we let the virus go into the healthcare system, it's not going to be pretty. And um, Bob, uh, what you said that around the change, I'm certain that things will never be the same again. One very economical and kind of uh, uh, US based reason is everybody was producing everything in China, everything iPhone was 90% made in China. Why? Because of costs. And when China had the COVID cases, everything shut down. In the future, I can bet that most of the production will be distributed around the world, which will mean higher costs. So ultimately, the bottom line will be a little bit less uh, focused on that little tiny change that using Chinese workers would be it will never go back to China in the same amount. Yes, it will be, let's say, 50% or 70%, but it will never be the same amount of work shifted to China because that's putting all the eggs in one basket. 